So, um, so t today we'll talk about careers. Um, I hope it's not a one-way me saying stuff because, um, well, that would be very short um, if, if it turns out to be like that. So I, I would like to be interactive. In, um, feel free to intervene, uh, much like um, you did so, so interestingly yesterday in the open mic. And um, in career advice, um, there's not really a kind of rules that I can give you. I, I more want to touch on uh, various things that I think are relevant, um, and they kind of come together in a big soup of, of uh, kind of ideas, uh, objectives, and uh, and things to consider when you're making decisions. Um, so the, the material I've prepared today is uh, is basically in the form of cartoons. Uh, they're not offensive, but I don't want to offend anyone by kind of. Uh, I mean, th this is not really kind of joke material, but uh, I think th these cartoons highlight various aspects that we might want to think about. So this is the most negative cartoon of all. It, it's the fact that there, there, is, uh, there is a pyramid in, um, in jobs, unfortunately. And this is kind of true in, in almost uh, any career. If, if you define career by just progressing and, and, uh, and getting a senior job, then there's almost always kind of more people uh, looking at that senior job uh, at any level that then, then there are uh, senior jobs and uh, well wherever you are it, you're probably not kind of uh, head of the United Nations up here or whatever is the top top job in the world um, so this is negative and and we'll try to understand why this is not even kind of a sensible way to, to really kind of look at things or at least I think it's not very sensible so a long time ago, there were only two jobs, hunting and gathering. And so a career advice was more simple, I guess. Uh, you just went to the cave. Uh, today, there are more options, and so uh, more, more, more things to think about. Um, most of us are here in the spirit of either being just before a PhD or we've done a PhD. We, we, we're here because at the moment we're, we're investing in, a, in an academic career. And so that has kind of a, a traditional branching into one or two postdocs, some sort of kind of tenure track or, uh, or long-term fellowship that then becomes, uh, if everything goes well, becomes a, a, a life kind of job in, a, in some department or, or institute. But, uh, but there's, of course, a very traditional other branch. Uh, at some point, you might branch out and go uh, more kind of... Uh, uh, into industry or, or, or some sort of activity related to, to, to more, more direct kind of economic impact in society. And a third very traditional branch is to um, go, go teaching in um, again, either a university level or, uh, or some sort of, uh, kind of high school or, or school situation. And, and, and most, uh, most countries also have um, opportunities for a kind of qualified people to end up in... Um, in, uh, in institutes or agencies, um, more or less research-led. Uh, uh, and I guess the point I want to make is that um, you can have a really successful career and life uh, anywhere here, really. The, the only reason one can be not happy is, is, is if personally you've invested uh, every single kind of aspiration one way, and then you end up being in one of the other branches. But, but really, the, the point I want to make also is um, if you look at industry, for example, then there are situations um, in recent decades where, uh, where the best research was actually done in industry in, in certain fields of, of science. Um, you just need to think about soft matter that, that you heard uh, uh, from Eric. Uh, yes, was it ju just yesterday? Yes, feels like a long time ago. <laughs> yesterday morning, you, you all kind of... Um, Got a very nice picture about uh, what soft matter is. Well, a lot of that soft matter was uh, was built at Exxon Labs um, in in, in, uh, in an effort to, to understand how, how to improve um, uh, oil production. But but, but the, at that time, the Exxon Labs wasn't just doing very applied research. They actually took a very broad view, and uh, a lot of the big actors in uh, in soft matter today actually spent uh, say a decade in in that Exxon Lab. And uh, similarly, some of the food companies. Um, the, the giant food companies like Nestle and, and Unilever have very big uh, labs that basically act as research labs. And, and, and not all the time, not every company, but there are companies at a given time that are doing some of the best research in, in certain fields. 
um, of course, um, Bell Labs um, ha has a very special place in, uh, in electronics. Um, there are other examples as well. Am I missing something big and obvious? Um, well, to, I, I think I am. I mean, today, if, if you're doing um, either a kind of applied automation or uh, or uh, or network analysis on the web or something like that, then, then then perhaps Google is the place to be. I mean, you won't beat the resources that some of those companies have on in specific areas if they really care about those by, by being in a in a small university group. So, so really, I mean, depending on what you do and and uh, and, and the, the well-defined kind of historical moment, th th there are situations where <coughs> where the best research is done not not really through this branch, but but through through some other branch. And agencies, uh, I'm, I'm thinking here, for example, um, most big countries ha have one big health institute that that doesn't seem to do very much. But then when there's a health emergency. You see it on the news, and that's the place that's actually trying to tackle the, the health emergency. So, so th there are very valuable kind of other places to be, uh, as as well as uh, as the path that probably most of us have have in our minds, a kind of I guess standard academic path. Okay, so we've asked ourselves where where we are. Um, each of us has some idea of where you want to be. Perhaps more than one option. It's actually healthy to to keep having a few options and, and to weigh them up. And, and we, we've got to think about um, how to get there and how to keep our options open. OK. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an interesting saying, a lateral move, so you're not really going forwards, but, but crabs only move laterally. So for them, it's uh, the obvious thing to do. Um, uh, who should stay in academia? That, that, that's one question. Um, the, there isn't. There isn't a faculty job for every PhD student. That, that's, that's entirely obvious. And uh, in some countries that make a lot of PhD students, like the uh, United States, the uh, United Kingdom, it's, it's actually very small, the fraction of people that go on from uh, being PhD students to being faculty people in that country. It, it's perhaps 10% or 15%. Um, others are going, going to other countries where there are, there are faculty jobs and not that many PhD students being, being kind of uh, uh, produced. Um, but but a lot of other people are, are exiting academia. So 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 one th one thing to obviously keep in mind is um, try to do what you're good at. Um, if you find yourself uh, being being um, uh, kind of very competitive and being very encouraged by everybody around you, that then th that's a good sign. That's, that probably means um, that, that that you, you can, can stay there. If the signs are a medium, then. Uh, and that's an encouragement to, to, look, to look around more. Understand your constraints and see if you can get around them. Um, you, especially while, while you're young and uh, during your PhD or, or soon after, uh, you're still kind of not set exactly in stone. You're not kind of a marble statue. Um, you, you, can, uh, you can understand uh, whether there are things you can improve. Um, you can understand compared to people around you, um, if you have more constraints, for example, uh, you don't want to travel, then that's, that's a fairly big constraint. Uh, or on the other hand, if, if you are free to travel and others around you aren't, then, then that's a huge advantage in terms of, uh, kind of finding opportunities uh, and jobs. Um, so how did you get a job? It's uh, it's not about <laughs> not just about kind of having a few good papers or kind of the best PhD, uh, the best uh, CV. Um, it's really a product of many factors. So for, for I guess for a given scientific output, I mean, you do have to have uh, a minimum that, that people will recognize uh, as yours, or, or more than a minimum in many cases. But but as well as that. Uh, you, you have to invest in uh, in your network of connections. People have to know you. People have to trust you. Uh, essentially, people have to want you as far as the scientific community. If you're going to make it that way, and if you're going to make it uh, towards industry, th there's a whole set of uh, of other things that you need to be able to prove, and uh, that the industry research people will be looking for. Um, okay, so this guy, <laughs> this guy has to get his paper published. 
has to cross all, all the swords and uh, are being battered around and says this is big improvement over previous uh, peer review processes. Um, so publishing is is a key thing because uh, kind of the published paper is basically our little kind of deliverable, and it's the it's the thing that people can most easily count in terms of uh, kind of uh, seeing what, what what somebody has done. Um, we've got to ask ourselves: Is there anything else uh, as well as as kind of just publishing papers and kind of having a list of papers that that, that we should do and that we we can do to kind of survive in this, uh, especially in the academic path. Um, some of these are open points. Maybe I'll keep going, and we can come back to them. Uh, there's uh, there's constraints. I've mentioned travel. Um, so, <laughs> so obviously, if you have a relationship, it's not just about incomes, um, but but uh, kind of family and, and uh, whether it's one relationship or or parents or siblings, whatever. Um, it's often something that, that does kind of uh, uh, put constraints and, and influences choices. Um, if you are in a in a very kind of um, market organized system uh, like the United States and to some extent the United Kingdom, then being being mobile is is a is a requirement. Sometimes you usually have to move between places, uh, and definitely helps. Um, not it helps not least because. You can actually look at all the job openings uh, anywhere they are. Um, as a counter side to that, uh, other countries um, don't actually encourage movements, and uh, and what we have to do to kind of progress is uh, really stay put and be the person in place at the right time when when a job appears where you are. Um, so, so I think it's actually it's healthy to, to that that science is organized with motility and uh, and generally. I mean, there's a very strong correlation between uh, countries where, where science is, is rich and healthy and, and, and countries where people move, but, uh, but countries that have least, less resources. Um, and I know because Italy is always kind of a middle ground between uh, trying to be uh, kind of an advanced scientific country and, and, and not being one, uh, so it's always kind of halfway, then, uh, then countries that, that kind of are not in, in the kind of the traditional leading um, league um, are generally organized with much less motility. Um, so that's something to be aware of, kind of who, who's gonna get, if, if you do want to actually make your career in, in your country, which is not one of the you know, Western-like ones, then um, what is the best strategy to actually land that job? But also, how, how can you, if, if you don't think, well, if you want the job, but you don't think that's actually the best way to run a scientific system, how, how do you kind of tension between the two things? Um, okay, don't get stuck. Um, uh, I was here last year as well. So, so sometimes people say, well, um, this is what I'm doing, my institute does this, uh, I can do it, but uh, I don't see kind of any opportunities or, or nowhere else to, kind of to go. I don't know what to do. Um, and also sometimes you're doing a PhD, which, which is kind of narrow and, and kind of a bit dead end. Well, I think in the, in the spirit of how we've run this school, you should really kind of always be, be thinking as, a, as independent people. And in some sense, all, all the time you're actually doing a PhD, you're being trained, yes, to do research and make papers in that particular area, but, but also to, to be independent and to understand how to do research in general. And if you are going to be a good, serious scientist, you really have to take that uh, and believe in that and, and have confidence. Um, so what we've tried to instill here in these two weeks is also the idea that it's not that expensive, not that difficult to do something quite creative, and that this is a good moment in, in the history of this hands-on area of science uh, to actually do very powerful things with, with not that much. Um, so, so, so really the encouragement is to keep thinking, and you can start side projects, whether they are uh, <coughs> with younger students in the spirit of kind of training them, or whether they are really uh, research projects, you can actually take power and do interesting stuff. So, so don't get stuck scientific, this is kind of, I have this in mind as being scientifically stuck in a, in a particular line that sooner or later will, will come to an end, as, as all research lines do. This is a 
this is a graph um, still on the same point really uh, that I've taken from uh, Uri Alon's um, kind of a, uh, career advice material. Um, so he says that there are really two ways in which uh, kind of PhD advisors advise their students and more generally how, how people approach, uh, mm, say, deciding that there's a, that there's a science problem. Um, one way is uh, objective driven. So, so you're here at point A, you know some stuff and you have some equipment and you decide that trying to get to B is, is the best thing. B will give you a nice paper and, and, and then either you tell your student or you head to the lab yourself and you hack away uh, getting to B. So sometimes that works and, uh, and things are exactly as you planned. It's, it's quite rare actually because if, if it was so obvious that you could go from A to B, then one, one of the other kind of 100,000 people might have done this already <laughs> with sometimes. Um, but other times it works. I mean, you're the one who thought about it. It's, it's fairly well defined and you or your student uh, in six months or one year gets from A to B and, and, and a paper is made. Uh, very good. And then, then B becomes A and it starts again. And you can, uh, sooner or later, this will actually not work. And then, um, so Rilan says, quite often you start from A, you're heading to B, but there's a big kind of cloud, things don't work, uh, you get lost. And, and, um, <clears throat> and in that situation, if you keep trying to get to B, that may not be the best strategy. You, you've got to uh, train yourselves and also train your students to, to also work out what to do in case uh, the objective-driven strategy uh, uh, fails. And he says, well, this is really where we're nurturing and explaining to people how they can find new problems is the best strategy because then every brain becomes an independent source of ideas and in going from A to B and getting lost, you may end up in C. C may be more interesting because uh, B was the obvious thing that you could actually see and that everybody could see as being the right thing. C is something where you've learned uh, in part and, and also you've kept thinking more and more and, and sometimes C can be a better outcome than B. Um, in, if you're actually doing science, um, and again, I think this is, this is relevant both if you're doing kind of applied research in, a, in some company or, or in academia. And again, for yourselves, if you're at the stage where you're deciding what to do for yourself or when you give tasks to students, you've got to balance this uh, kind of gain axis with a, a difficulty axis, and you constantly have to assess, especially if you're telling other people what to do, you have to assess whether it's going to be easy for, or hard for them and a small gain or large gain on you know, some sort of absolute scale. And of course, there's kind of a sweet spot up here where the, it's not too hard to get the result and, and the, the gain is big. Um, what you don't want to do is kind of get people stuck on things that are very difficult. And even if they work, they're, they're not going to be that exciting, which would be kind of this corner. So, so you want to kind of maximize uh, some sort of uh, a locus of points up here where, where there's a balance between uh, achieving the gain and the gain being, being some value of some value. So, so choosing topics and um, choosing things which are sensible for yourselves and, and for your students is, is a really, really key thing. And uh, if you look around at kind of people who've uh, been successful and um, whose students have gone on to be successful, uh, th this is one of the things that they've done kind of with care and, and with uh, consistency uh, uh, over long times. Um, at, at some point, again, wh whether you're working for yourselves, then, then this would be just um, have a main project, but also keep thinking about possible side projects. R read, read on more than one topic so that if, if your main topic at some point fails, you've, you've got kind of other sticky points like a Jekyll with, with four, four legs uh, attaching to things and, and knowing people in more than one area. That, that's, that's really important. Uh, develop a network. Um, again, it could be for yourselves. And, and also, if you have students, you've, you've got to link your students into those networks. Um, but by talking, by collaborating, there's no shame in collaborating, I believe. Um, in collaborations, you, you need to have your own special role but, but uh, you will actually achieve a lot more by, by talking and being part of uh, a system than you will by trying to be kind of a, uh, kind of a shell in the middle of, a, of this big science, uh, kind of a big basket. 
find out what can be your special contribution, what are the things that, that you can do well. <coughs> if, you, if you're just a, a master student starting a PhD, uh, these will be very simple things like, uh, okay, I, I code well, so I want a project which, it's not gonna be 100% coding, but where coding can be used, because I, I, I can use that, that kind of skill. If you know how to build electronics, again, you're not gonna be defined by being the electronics person, you don't want that, but you can find a project where, where that will be used. Um, if you're good at talking to people, well, if they put you down in a cave by yourself, then uh, th that, that skill will not be used. Um, don't kind of offend people, there's, uh, there's no reason, and, and these things uh, can kind of uh, haunt you much later. Pe people remember uh, people for good reasons and also for, for bad reasons, and there's no reason to be kind of uh, having enemies if you don't need that. Um, and of course, uh, kind of try to have some level of funding. Um, th this will g gain you the respect of, of everyone and will, will make kind of uh, work possible. Um, to get funding, we spoke about this with, uh, with a few of you yesterday afternoon. Um, of course, you have, to, you have to write some sort of grant or, or attract some sort of funding from some local agency, a local company, or some, some, some charity. Uh, if, if you're in a big Western country, then all these things are kind of very, very organized. There are websites with precise rules, but depending on where you are, uh, you've got to work out what, what your colleagues and peers are doing, or if there's even some avenue that nobody else has explored, then you're the first ones to, to actually explore and get funding. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of, kind of exploration and, and energy that, that is involved in getting the resources that you need for, uh, for actually working. Um, the advice is be as useful as you can. Um, if you're useful to your colleagues, then um, generally you, you get kind of a positive feedback back and, and, uh, and, uh, and help. But it doesn't mean <coughs> saying yes and, uh, and doing everybody's tasks because that, that would kind of make you grind immediately to, to a halt in terms of uh, everything else, which is actually the things that you want to do. This is try to have uh, a few eggs and, and be ready for, for different things to, to work out, not, not just kind of one single uh, idea that's very risky. Okay, so I've been talking kind of broadly, uh, perhaps very broadly, um, but we may want to go back to some of the points I tried to make. Um, these are some more questions. Um, uh, w what are the issues in, uh, in, in your particular countries and, and for yourselves? Um, I, I think if I were in your shoes, um, and I, I was to some extent, I, I, I studied in Italy, then went to UK. But it's not such a big jump, but, and it's not far away, but it was still a different country. I, the, the big question is, um, do you stay where you are, or, or, or do you try to move? Basically, do you, and if you move, do you go for a limited period, like a one or two year f fellowship, or a, just the PhD and then go back? Or, or do you move for good because, uh, you've decided you want to be a scientist and you can only be uh, kind of a good scientist in Germany. So you go to Germany and, and try to make it there. And it, you, if you do that sort of thing, you've got to accept the culture and, and, and the difficulties of actually living <coughs> your whole life, potentially in a, in a completely different culture. On the other hand, if you, if you stay, and, and you all come from different places, so staying means quite different things, but uh, can you actually be a competitive scientist if you work locally? How can you do good science if, if the funding is, is, uh, is, is much less than other people doing the same topic? So what you don't want to do is, is run a race where systematically you get beaten because, uh, because there's just less money. That, that kind of is, very, is completely pointless. So, so one way in which um, you know better than me, if you look around, uh, this has been uh, addressed uh, traditionally, is, is that um, uh, lots of developing countries are very strong on theory and, and, um, and um, have very, very little experimental activity because theory is obviously something you can do with, with much less, with much fewer resources and you can, it's more easy to be competitive doing theoretical stuff. Um, but this is just the way it is and it's not necessarily bad, but, but it's also a, a limit to, to the system. Uh, not least, I mean, if the whole, scientific system is doing very theoretical work, then almost by definition, it's, it's, it's much further away from, from any uh, application, any company, et cetera, and, and this creates 
a bit of a distorted view in society. Um, also in the West, depending on the country and the moments, but there, there are moments when public opinion believes uh, kind of science is a bit useless and should be cut. But, but this would happen even more if that science was just, just theory and just very abstract, which uh, it sometimes is in developing countries. It's, it's a very high level in, in groups, but, but, uh, but really completely disconnected from, from kind of the real uh, economy. So that, that's definitely a limit. And in the long, in the long run, um, you would want uh, kind of things to be more homogeneous and, and science to have the whole spectrum of things that people and students can, can move and, uh, and there, can be a more, there can be a more natural and not traumatic kind of link and bridge between, uh, between science and, uh, and, uh, and activities outside academia. Um, it, it's crucial to have scientists everywhere. So, so I, I would be really sad if, if the result of our thinking was then, um, okay, science can only be done in rich countries, so, so the only solution is for everyone to compete and go there and, 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 uh, and say, and, and no, no science, uh, uh, say, say no science in Africa. I mean, that, that would be terrible uh, for, for, a, for, a, for a huge number of reasons, um, not least because I think we all believe that science actually has a role to play in, in, uh, in developing countries, um, in developing the countries, I mean. Uh, but also, it, it's, it, it would be, um, I mean, another worry I would have is that we actually want uh, the whole, every citizen in the world to be, to be educated to, to a level that uh, they, can, they can understand the big problems and big challenges. And um, so, so in that sense, it would be incredibly wrong to just have a few kind of hubs of, of great science because we're not, well, as, a, as, as, a, as humanity, we're doing science to advance our knowledge, but, but it's not just the knowledge that a few need to have, of course. It's, it's, it's the knowledge that we want to, to kind of bring back to everyone. Okay, so, so I think although it's a model that might spontaneously emerge, the, the one of hubs and, and places of excellence only in some places, it's, a, it's something that we need to be aware of and kind of actively uh, counteract. Um, this is something that is close to my heart. I mentioned this at the open mic the other day. Um, the, there's, there's a big, big, big thing about kind of models. I mean. Um, I think if, if, if I understand correctly what, what China is doing, that it's really adopted almost a, a US system of, in terms of how faculty is recruited and how the grants work, et cetera. South Korea has done the same. Um, Taiwan is, is very similar. I mean, there's a, there's a whole number of countries that have developed, that have really expanded science in a big way in recent years, and they've done so by just adopting a certain model. Um, we heard yesterday that um, perhaps in, in, in uh, South America there is a movement to make things different. I didn't really understand uh, the details of that, but I'm very curious. But, but, uh, but this is a challenge for you. I mean, if, if you're actually working in countries that are suddenly developing, well, that's the big opportunity to, to really think about how, how funding, how hiring people is done, um, how funding is going to work, uh, and uh, and what are the consequences of kind of setting in place rules which will then kind of affect um, entire careers of lots of people. The, um, and, and particularly if a model is adopted and distorted even worse than the original model, then that's really where damage can come. And, um, and I've heard kind of horror stories both from South Korea and China about uh, rules that are very strictly imposed on uh, uh, a number of papers, first authorships, I mean, things that are really kind of completely irrational and, and make the whole process of being a scientist kind of horrible, right? Um, some of these kind of very talented PhD students or postdocs that, have to, that want to return to those countries are, are, are then uh, kind of really single-mindedly uh, trying to get first author papers. And that, that's, that kind of is not the purpose of being a scientist and, and gen generating new results. Okay, there's, uh, there's kind of causes of hope, I think, uh, today, now. Um, e e even if, kind of if you come from a system that has uh, fewer economic resources, first of all, because you have to keep in mind that kind of human capital is, is really, it comes even before kind of fancy in instrumentation. 
um, with, with the access we have now to to to, to journals and to the preprint archive and, and generally to 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 free information, um, large databases that provides very rich sources of uh, of data if you're doing kind of large data analysis and things like that. There, there's actually there's, I think, less barriers than ever before in doing kind of competitive science with, um, with, with not very much. And also kind of cameras, computers, all of these things have, have progressed to the point that you can do very powerful things with, uh, with very little money. Um, and things are changing faster than I think the, the science system is really understanding. Uh, publishing is, 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 uh, is being kind of constantly challenged by by things like open access uh, and, and, and generally, um, although kind of uh, um, journals with impact, with high impact factor, um, have been taken as being very important for, uh, for for career progression and people who publish in a high impact journal factor impact factor journal um, are then hired. This system, if you think of it, is, is completely logic. I mean, people have given the the editors of these journals, which, which are often, uh, th th if you look at them, they're often the, the oh, I don't say, I don't know how to say it, uh, they're often the worst scientists who failed completely at being either a, an academic researcher or, or, or an industry researcher, and, and, and the job they, they found was in the end being an editor, and we're then giving these people the, the power to decide careers of everybody else. Uh, it's, it's a bit absurd. Um, so it's a bit absurd also that um, the public funds the science, the scientists to do the work and then have to pay for publishing, and then the journal gets paid again uh, to, 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 for people to read that paper. And uh, in the midst of that, uh, peer review was done, which is a time-consuming process that nobody paid. So, so I think that there's lots of kind of fa fairly illogic things that, that made sense when uh, when the science system was uh, was much smaller and made of made of a few individuals, but 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 is not scaling up properly and is not kind of serving science as a system very well now. So so whenever there's kind of something illogic, it goes on for a bit, but then there, there can be a catastrophe and, and things change a lot. And and if you look at the preprint archives and other ways of uh, kind of giving value and commentaries to papers, then there's there's lots of ways in which, which potentially science uh, outputs could be reorganized. And <clears throat> I think 20 years from now, may maybe it will still be like, like now, there will be journals, they'll be ranked, and it could be. Maybe the system will not change, but it's also possible that the system will be totally different and, and whoever spots it first will have a big advantage. Um, so this, I think, is my last slide, and then I really want to kind of Try, try to hear comments back. Um, so wherever you are, you've got to do the, the best science possible to you. Um, you've got to get noticed for good reasons um, so, that, so that people, whether they're collaborating closely or, or just knowing you from a conference or from a workshop, they, they, you try to kind of ha have positive views of yourself in the community. You've got to always behave ethically. I mean, this goes without saying, but um, so science has a, has a very high kind of moral and, uh, and uh, unspoken rules, and, and you can't really be a scientist unless, unless you're playing by the, by the non-written rules in, in every way. Um, it's not just about kind of what choice of, of topic you, you go for. It's really the whole process of how you behave. Um, the more you understand kind of broad changes and new challenges, the, the more you'll be ahead of the game. Um, so um, the, the people who, who really, really make it as a scientist are, are, are not just the ones who publish well on areas defined by others. The, 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 the real groundbreaker people, <coughs> if you think of soft matter, uh, the, the gens, um, uh, perhaps people like Sam Edwards who kind of brought polymer science into, in, into physics. Um, so, so those are people who, the, I mean, it wasn't even kind of the papers they made. They, they created entire fields, and then uh, and, and hundreds of faculty today w wouldn't be doing what they're doing unless those people had suddenly kind of invented a field. And um, the same is true for uh, kind of nonlinear systems. Uh, 
at some point. And in, in the 70s, uh, the study of uh, phase transitions and, and critical phenomena. So if, if you are, it probably wouldn't be one, per sometimes this is one person, sometimes it's, it's a collection of two or three very talented people who just get together and, and have a sense that there's something that wasn't being done, that can be done, and it is really tremendously important. If you are lucky enough to, to, to gather that and turn it into a field, then um, that, that's revolutionary. Um, and it can't happen to everyone, but if you don't think, then it will definitely not happen. Um, um, so, so here, it's, I, I really want to stress linking to other people. You've got to be part of, of some community. By community, I mean um, uh, people with, with uh, similar interests, with whom you can, you can talk, sometimes collaborate, or even just share ideas. And, and sometimes even better, because if, you're, if what you're doing is new, you've actually got to grow your community. And this is, if it works, it's really where you create lots of added value. I mean, in science, fields and areas uh, die when they get exhausted. They, they, it's not because they weren't good, on the contrary. I mean, they might have been great, but at some point, ev everything that made sense has been done. And that, that area then, then shrinks away. But, but new areas are constantly growing. So if you're able to, to understand what, what is a possible area and grow it and create a community, then it will be at the center of that. And, and, uh, and you'll, you'll really enjoy kind of being a scientist, because you'll be, you'll be central and, and part of something which is expanding. But, but if you're not kind of lucky enough to do that, then, then at least you have to find um, some nice people with whom you enjoy working and, and sharing ideas. So careers are varied and predictable, and, um, but, but, but the best way of actually kind of tackling that is to kind of take satisfaction for wh whatever form of research or being a scientist you, you're able to do. Even if you end up being an editor of a journal, you can do that in a good way. Um, and then um, at, at kind of constantly in life, but, but the younger you are, the, the more you, you really have to kind of invest in that. You've got to grow your skills um, in areas that you enjoy. Um, learn, learn new subjects, learn, learn uh, how to do things in, uh, in modern ways, uh, etc. So that's all I have to say. Um.